Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Reduce California Red Scale Damage with Mating Disruption, sponsored by Sutera. I'm Robin Sitberg of Meister Media Worldwide, publisher of Citrus Grower Magazine. This webinar has been approved for a half CEU credit in integrated pest management from CCA, and it is pending approval for one credit from CDPR. To receive credit, you must watch the entire webinar, including the Q&A portion. There will be a quiz at the end of the webinar for those who would like the credit from CDPR. You must pass with a score of at least 70%. I'll tell you more about how to receive those credits at the end of the webinar. We'll also have time for some questions at the end of the presentation, so please submit any questions you have in the questions pane at the lower left corner of your screen. So now I'd like to turn it over to Joan Wickham, Marketing Strategist for Sutera, and she's going to tell you more about our speakers. Thanks so much, Robin, and good morning, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our session today about California Red Scale. Today's webinar will be led by two very knowledgeable members of Sutera's technical team, Greg Montez and Mondo Perez. But before I pass it over to Greg and Mondo, um, I just wanted to give a little bit of background on Sutera. Sutera is the global leader in sustainable pest control, headquartered in Bend, Oregon, where we have the only dedicated manufacturing facility in the world, which is pictured here. Fully integrated, we handle everything in that facility, from early stage research and formulation to product design and manufacturing. And why that matters to you is that we're able to deliver quality products you can trust with consistent chemistry and the most reliable hardware. And also very important um, is that we have a local dedicated sales and technical team of experts, like Greg and Mondo, who you're going to hear from today, that are really our boots on the ground to support growers and PCAs and gather the insights that lead those innovation efforts in Bend. This technical team is really critical to Sutera because solving grower problems is our singular focus and passion. And that, of course, means spending time in the field and engaging with all of you. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers. First, Greg Montez. Rich experience in the field and the lab spanning nearly every crop grown in California makes Greg Montez one of California's premier pest control advisors. While he now works with us in industry, Greg worked for over 20 years as a research associate at the University of California at the Kearney Agricultural Research Center with a specialty in citrus insect pest management. Greg is passionate about sharing his expertise, which I'm sure you'll hear today, um, to help educate and inspire the industry to adopt better practices that benefit agriculture today and secure its future tomorrow. You'll also hear today from Mondo Perez. With over a decade of experience as a pest control advisor for Wonderful Citrus and Wonderful Orchard, technical field manager Mondo Perez offers a wealth of agronomy expertise to our customers. Based in Shafter, California, Mondo leads cutting edge research in field trials, product demonstrations, and training in mating disruption. His career has included the management of large acreage for citrus, pistachios, and almonds, as well as field trial research in insecticides, fertilizers, nutrients, nematodes, and soil amendments. He has also worked with researchers at the University of California Cooperative Extension. Greg, Mondo, and the rest of the field team are really passionate about working with growers, as I'm sure you'll hear today, and they're looking forward to engaging with you during this session and beyond. Lastly, just on administrative note, a reminder that this presentation is not a recommendation, so please consult your PCA to determine the best practices for your operation and, of course, always adhere to regulations on pesticide labels. And with that, I will turn it over to Greg. I appreciate that, Joan. Thank you very much. Um, so California Red Scale is the uh, primary pest of citrus grown in California and all over the world. Uh, it's, it's global in, in scope. And like the, uh, the author Sun Tzu says, it's very important to know your enemy. This is the description of the life cycle of California red scale. There are up to four and could be five generations of scale in a, in a growing season. The reason that this is important is because there are some forms of red scale that are more susceptible to control measures than others. And I'd like for you to notice that I have put on this life cycle some numbers. Uh, they are degree days, all insects develop by temperature. The warmer the temperature, the faster they develop. But you can count, you can predict the stage that an insect will be in 
uh, based on how much ambient temperature and heat units that, that it, it has been exposed to. So there can be, in the life cycle of a California red scale, two important forms, two, two important phases, and that's called a biofix. A biofix is just a stage in the life cycle that you can start counting from. Most PCAs and growers identify the, the males being caught in a pheromone trap as being a biofix, and that's perfect. That's exactly right. There can be a second biofix when the crawlers start emerging. We'll get into this a little bit later in more detail, but for right now, it's most important to know that there is 1,100 degree days in the California red scale life cycle from egg, from, or there are no eggs, from, from crawlers to crawlers or from males to males or from third instar females to third instar females. All of that is 1,100 degree days. This is a photo or some photos of the various life cycle, life stages. The crawlers come out from underneath the female. The female never moves. Once she settles down and starts feeding on, on a twig, leaf, or, or, or fruit, she never moves again. That's her permanent resting point. Crawlers are released, and they are the ones who actually can spread the infestation. When the mature female, uh, when, when the female reaches maturity, a male will find her and mate with her, and that's what we see in this next slide. Uh, that's actually a male California red scale uh, inseminating a female. It's, uh, this is another vulnerable point in the life cycle of the red scale. This is what pheromone mating disruption is, is uh, intended to control. This is, this is the vulnerable stage where, where Jeteris products step in. Adult male scale are easily identified. Oops, could I skip ahead? I did. Mixed California red scale, once the second and third generation appear in an orchard, the, the, the generations overlap. You see on this fruit that there are white caps, which are first in stars, and there are the brown, the, the, the adult females with the, the brown circles with the white dot in the middle. Those are adults waiting to be mated. It's interesting in the photo to the left there of the, the oranges, you can see some streaks running down the orange. That's not red scale damage, that's actually citricola scale damage. Citricola scale produces honeydew, a sticky, sugary sap from the, the orange tree, and it tends to drip. Later on in the season, that honeydew will turn black and, and get moldy, but that's not the focus of today's talk. We're focusing on red scale today. So the adult male scale. It's important to note that male scale has this orange coppery bar across its thorax. We'll see later on in the presentation why that is important to know. But for now, this adult male scale is about half the size of your typical Argentine ant or, or pavement ant. It's a very, very small insect. California red scale is most closely related to aphids and white flies in the insect world. And so the, uh, the, the, only the males will, will fly. They're the only form of the insect that can move any distance uh, longer than, than five or six inches, really. So California red scale, how does it move through the orchard? It can be picked up by wind, believe it or not. In a strong windstorm, the, the crawlers can be actually lifted off of a branch, off of a leaf, and thrown to the next tree. Perching birds will pick them up uh, on their, their claws, on their feet, and move them from tree to tree. But most red scale is moved through the orchard by machinery. or infested trees are planted 
uh, having been been uh, infested in the nursery, that's one way of moving moving spread scale around. But most most of them are moved mechanically. Scales will drop onto machinery, get moved to the next tree, hop off, and and start their life cycle there. So that's how red scale disperses. There are a, there's a gradient of responses in citrus to California red scale. Lemons being mostly fresh market and the females being very easy to see on the yellow lemon skin, lemon peel, lemon rind. Uh, lemons are very susceptible to red scale. Grapefruit and pomelo all, also mostly fresh market or entirely fresh market in California. But grapefruit and pomelo are, are, are pruned or are trained the, to form a certain shape of the tree. And when scaffold branches of pomelo and grapefruit are infested with red scale, they become very brittle and, and they break very easily. So that's another primary damage. Mandarins and clementines, again, fresh market fruit. You don't want to see red scale on the fruit. The, 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 the purchasers, the, the consumer in the market uh, would react negatively to, to red scale. Navel oranges are less susceptible, but again, it's a cosmetic problem in navel oranges. Nobody wants to see scaly fruit. Valencias in California are typically sent to juice. So they're the least problem in Valencias until they get to be, until the, the population of red scale gets to be so great that it, actually injures the tree itself. So this is a descending list of susceptible varieties from, from lemons to Valencias. Integrated pest management for California red scale, there was a fantastic program for red scale monitoring and control from the 80s through the 90s into the 2000s. Integrated pest management does not rely on any one control measure. There are actually four in an integrated pest management program. Chemicals certainly have a place. There is, uh, there's nothing wrong with using a chemical control measure when it's required. That's one of the tools. Biological control, we rely heavily on that. We'll go into deeper detail in just a moment. Environmental control. Uh, Keeping the, the, uh, the equipment sanitized, keeping things clean in the orchard is a great help in managing red scale. But never forget that monitoring. Monitoring is a key for any integrated pest management program, whether it be citrus or rutabagas or almonds or anything. Uh, always monitor, always uh, keep abreast of what's going on in the orchard. That's with the traps. That's with a degree day model. However, this is boots on the ground. Moving through the orchard is, is vital in knowing, knowing your enemy, knowing your pest. So there are natural enemies of California red scale. These are four of them. Aphytus malinus is extremely important. Tomperiella bifasciata is also a native, it's a naturally occurring parasite. And you have two predators, Rhizobius and uh, Chrysoperla carnea. Chrysoperla, you may know better as a lacewing. This, this is a lacewing larva that you're seeing at, on this slide. Rhizobius is uh, very difficult to find in an orchard. It takes some looking for. But the two parasites, Comperiella and aphytus are very easy to recognize, and we'll go into that right now. These are the signs of aphytus malinus parasitism. You'll see that the, a female adult scale will have a hole bored through its outer shell where the adult wasp has emerged. Lifting that cap, you can see the remains of what used to be the female red scale has been consumed by the larval parasite by the larval wasp as, as part of its, its life stage. 
on occasion, you can actually find the larva itself. Once that cap is lifted, the larva will be underneath and feeding on what remains of the, of the red scale body. A phytus is key for control for a couple of reasons. Uh, it's easily mass reared. There are insectaries in California that actually produce a phytus for purchase. And a citrus grower can use these. A phytus is also very susceptible to the broad spectrum insecticides. Uh, once the phytus is disrupted, red scale is free to reproduce without without impediment. And keep that in mind. That we'll we'll uh, t touch on that in a bit. Comperiella is different. It's also a parasite, but it leaves different markings. There are uh, what's called meconium or fecal pellets, rats, if you will, that characterize Comperiella. You also see that Comperiella is a black wasp with kind of a hatched mark on the back. A phytus is a golden insect that uh, is uniform in color. Comperiella is, is easily distinguished from a phytus. So, conventional controls, insecticides for California red scale. There are three. The broad spectrum insecticides are carbaryl, chlorpyrifos, and dimethoate, and there are some others that are no longer used in, in California. Those have been supplanted by the narrower spectrum insecticides, pyroproxacin and uh, acetamiprid, imidacloprid, and buprofezin. Buprofezin is an insect growth regulator. We'll get into that in a bit. The California red scale pheromone is entirely specific to red scale. And it doesn't affect any other insect. This is a map that I created back in the 90s when I was working with the University of California. California red scale has been documented to become entirely resistant to most of the broad spectrum insecticides, the organophosphates, the chlorpyrifos, and the, the, uh, um, the dimethoate. Red scale resistance is, um, to those insecticides is rampant up and down the valley through you know, 30, 40 years of using these chemicals. They no longer work, which brought into to, to, which brought in the need to change the chemistries, change modes of action. The broad spectrum insecticides had benefits. Typically one or maybe even two applications would cover a grower for the whole growing season. And chlorpyrifos and dimethoate would control a large number of, of pests. They weren't specific, but they would always disrupt the phytus and the comperiella. They're toxic to people. They're toxic to non-targets. And as I just mentioned, they caught the, the, the red scale develop resistance to them very quickly. Also, the broad spectrum insecticides are not an option for organic production. Later on in the 90s, 2000s, we got some new chemistries, acetamiprid, buprofezin, spirotetramat is commonly used now. These are targeted. These only really affect the red scale or, or insects like red scale that feed from the, 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 the phloem, feed, feed from the plant, uh, uh, the, the lifeblood of the plant, of the tree. They're not quite as effective as the broad spectrum insecticides. Insecticide resistance is also a problem with these. After years of being used, the buprofezin, uh, the pyroproxacin are no longer as effective as they used to be. And I fear that spirotetramat is going to follow in that, that same channel. Uh, through, through years of being used, the red scale will just get used to it. Also, these chemicals are not an option for organic production. 
So now we come to the pheromone. California red scale pheromone is targeted for one insect and one insect only, red scale. Naval orange worm pheromone is targeted for one insect and one insect only. It, uh, it is formulated to last an entire growing season by Zutera. Our crack team of engineers and chemists have found a way to preserve and prolong the molecular integrity so that only one application is needed for the entire season. It is entirely non-toxic to everything, including red scale. This is not a poison. This is the insect communications that we're, we're disrupting. This is the, insects don't have uh, go to meeting.com and they don't have uh, the uh, California red scale only.com. This, this is their internet. This is how they communicate with one another. And the pheromone disrupts that. Having been uh, used for you know, countless hundreds of thousands of years, there really isn't any chance of the red scale becoming resistant to its own communication program. However, having said that, red scale re pheromone it takes several growing seasons, five or six in some cases, to get a, 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 a population under control. And if there's a very, if you're starting out with a, with a very heavy infestation, insecticides may still be necessary. This is an augmentation. This is a part of an integrated pest management control program. So it, it will take some time for an orchard to, to wean itself off of the hard chemistries and into the soft ones. Key part of any integrated pest management program is monitoring. Monitoring starts with field scouting. You, there is no substitute for boots on the ground. This is the way to identify trees in the orchard that have heavy infestations. Also, this is the way to identify places in the orchard that uh, weren't properly covered by an insecticide application, a place where where the ground rig has uh, run out of liquid or needed to be refueled. Boots on the ground, field scouting is entirely necessary uh, for no red scale to entire blowouts. The pheromone traps are fantastic for identifying a biofix. They're also used in the fourth flight of California red scale to determine whether Control measures the following season are required. And then there's a third way of monitoring red scale. This is called the uh, crawler tapes. And I've got some photographs of crawler tapes. We'll go into that when I get to that slide. Pheromone traps. Male scale will tend to cluster near the top of the card. You can see on this photograph that there's a little red rubber, it's called a septa. It's a little red, it looks like a little red rubber eraser. It's stuck into the trap and scale will tend to cluster, tend to get stuck to the card at that location. If there's fewer than 200 scale on a card, you just count the whole card. But in order to save time, in order to be more efficient, if there's a lot of scale on the card, you just count the bold squares. Those are printed on purpose. They represent one fifth of the surface area of the trap. If you count the scale in the bold squares, multiply by five, and you'll get a, a, a pretty good approximation of what's on the entire card. In the fourth generation, at the end of the season, at the, we're talking now September, October, if more than a thousand scale are counted on a card, that is a clear indication that there's too many red scale in the orchard and some control measure is necessary. The University of California provides monitoring sheets. This is an example taken right off of the uh, UCIPM website, website. There, the link to it is given right there on the right. California red scale monitoring is, is very straightforward. You count what's on the card, you write it down in this, the form. 
and move on. So this is provided as a you know, part of UCIPM's website. The sticky tape is the best indication of a biofix. Once one crawler gets stuck on the tape, you might you may say this is day one of the biofix, and we're going to start counting degree days from today. California red scale crawlers are really easy to tell. They're unique on a, a double-sided sticky tape. They can't be, be confused for anything else that might be stuck there, such as a, 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 a citrus red mite or a two-spotted mite look very, very different from, from red scale crawlers. Again, once you catch a crawler, you know that the, uh, the generation has started 1,100 degree days from that day will be the next generation. And so plan your control strategies accordingly. The University of California publishes degree days, degree day accumulations. This is a graph that shows each life stage as it progresses through through the growing season, starting off with first crawlers at 550 degree days. We expect the third male flight at, at, at uh, 2200 degree days, the fourth male flight is, will be at 3300 degree days. So it's very easy to calculate these, these out. And again, this is public record, this is public knowledge, uh, access the ECIPM website or consult your, your pest management consultant for the, the current degree day accumulation. Red scale damage is twofold. When red scale gets onto the fruit, it's a cosmetic problem. It's not going to decrease yield any, it just looks ugly. And nobody's going to buy a scaly crested fruit. However, in severe populations, what we call a blow up, a blow out, red scale will cause the branches of the tree to become brittle and actually break. And at that point, when, that, when the scale is that severe, a grower might decide to remove the tree uh, or go out with a, uh, a hand applicator and, and, and soak the tree in insecticide. But uh, uh, at that stage, with that severe of an infestation, it's fruit kill is very difficult to manage. At this point, I would like to, uh, to turn the, the topic, turn the talk over to Mondo Perez. He's going to cover the uh, the products that Zutera has to, to control red scale. Take it away, Mondo. Thank you, Greg. So now we're going to discuss one of the ways to control California red scale. Earlier in the presentation, Greg discussed the core pillars of a good IPM program for citrus. Mating disruption is one of those key components of what we like to say a toolbox to manage CRS. In the upcoming slides, I will cover what is mating disruption and how to use mating disruption. So what is mating disruption? Mating disruption is technology that modifies insect behavior. It confuses the male so they can't find the females to mate. So that's going to suppress the press pressure or, you know, thereby suppressing the press pressure. Checkmate CRS is a terrorist season-long maiden disruption dispenser for control of California red scale and citrus crops. So here's the exciting schematic of insect behavior with and without maiden disruption. Without maiden disruption, males can track the pheromone emitted by the CRS females, which makes it easier for them to find the females and mate, increasing the CRS population, which you don't want. With mating disruption, synthetic pheromones are released into the orchards, confusing the males, but they can't tell the difference between females and the synthetic female pheromone. Because of this, they can't find the females, which results in decreased mating and reduced pest population. 
So I would like to remind our audience that mating disruption interferes with mate finding. It does not kill. So no mating means no offspring. So mating disruption, mode of action, or some people would prefer mechanism of action. As a reminder, pheromones are highly species specific. The most important thing is to have a reliable vehicle to get the pheromone out into the orchard, which is what Cetera does. So why growers choose Checkmate CRF for California Red Scale? A good question. Cetera formulates and synthesizes pheromone in our state-of-the-art facility, Bend, Oregon. And if you get a chance, you need to visit. All of Cetera's maiden disruption products are harmless to all living organisms and beneficial insects. The product is also suitable for organic production. So here's another overview of the benefits of using Cetera's dispensers. I'm going to talk about a few items listed here. Pre-harvest interval. So what is a PHI? It's zero days. Well, I just purchased CRS uh, dispensers. They came in a bucket. Where do I store them? Do I need to store them in cold storage, hot storage? Cold storage is not required. The dispenser bucket should be stored in a cool and dry room. This is a standard indication for storage of many products in many industries. Another item here is what about season long protection? Well, Cetera has tested Checkmate CRS under a wide range of climatic conditions, and all of them, the product has provided mating disruption for one natural year or longer. The exact duration of the product depends on the weather conditions that it undergoes in the field. Improper placement in the field may result in reduction of effective duration. So please always follow label, in, label instructions and seek for uh, Cetera's advice. Easy to deploy or how to use. So the best time to deploy Checkmate CRS is in the spring before the onset of the first or the second flight and after pruning. Tang patterns are determined by tree spacing, so follow Cetera's Checkmate deployment guide for hang patterns. Checkmate CRS dispensers should be evenly dispersed in the plot, especially at the prevalent wind side. The Checkmate CRS dispenser must be placed inside the canopy of the citrus tree at mid-height. Hanging inside at mid canopy height protects from excessive direct sun exposure and it minimizes loss from pruning and hedging. The hook should be hung on a sturdy thumb sized branches. So the next two slides, we're gonna share trial data with checkmate CRS and non-mating disruption reference. So everybody wants to see what the trial data looks like. So we have the non-mating disruption reference in red in the checkmate CRS and green in the CRS trap, uh, trap counts. And then the CRS damage reduction, you have a table there that we have no scales, some scales, and many scales. So what's the conclusion here? With the CRS traps, the checkmate CRS dispensers hindered the ability of males to find pheromone traps as compared to areas treated with grower standard practice. Okay, what about the reduction? The addition of C Checkmate CRS into the grower standard practice resulted into, an, into a 95% reduction in fruit damage. So the next slide I want to share is the Checkmate CRS dispensers in combination with oil sprays. Um, we had some questions about oil sprays, you know, the efficacy, does it clog up the pheromone? And here we are, we want to share this with you guys. Tetera has extensive experience with the product in multiple regions in a wide range of situations and conditions. In many of these, the product has been used in combination with the oil sprays here, at the, here in the trial data. 
The oil sprays have never had an impact in performance, and the use of oil plus Checkmate CRS have typically outperformed the use of each of them on their own. So the addition of Checkmate CRS into the grower's standard practices resulted in significant and damage reduction of fruit. The oil application showed no effect on mating disruption performance. So good monitoring practices. It should include our Cetera scale trap and CRS septa lure. Where and when do you, where and where do you hang the traps? Hang traps on the inside of the trees, away from the CRS dispensers. Do not hang the traps on outer edges of trees. Why? Because you'll prevent damage by the pruning and hedging. Hang traps in early February and March to detect early activity and continue to trap until late October and November. Mating disruption is very effective for pest control, but it's not a standalone product. A good monitoring program is part of every effective IPM program. Mating disruption does not replace the need to monitor. The proper monitoring can identify high pest pressure and the potential need to spray. Now that we talked about the product itself, I want to share what the Terra's team can offer. Grower services. We are listening to you. And with every step of the way, we have a new field service team that can assist with deployment training, product training, hang patterns, and Q&A. So feel free to ask us any questions we'll be able to answer. And we also have a top tier technical team who can train in scouting, monitoring, and pest behavior. Thank you so much, Mondo and Greg. That was really informative. Um, we've left some time to answer the audience's questions, so I will turn it back over to Robin. Okay, thank you, Mondo and Greg. Um, we do have time for questions, so if you have any questions and you haven't submitted them yet, please go ahead and do so in the question pane at the lower left part of your screen. And we have gotten some questions already, so we're just going to go ahead and get started with those. <clears throat> um, Mondo, the first question is for you. Um, it says, was this, with this particular trial, were there any CRS sprays in addition to Checkmate? Uh, yes, there was. Besides oil, we also had an uh, insecticide um, spray program with it. Uh, it was Momento. But we have done other trials with other insecticides uh, that are used for California red scale. Okay, thank you. All right, Greg, we've got a couple for you here. Um, what is the pest threshold that could indicate economic damage? So economic damage is going to vary from crop to crop, from a variety to variety. What's economic damage in lemons will be different from what's economic damage in mandarins. And also it depends on the, the season and the price that uh, the fruit are selling at. So an economic injury level, uh, economic damage threshold, those are not things that you can actually read out of a book. Uh, they, they float, they, they, they move, they uh, can vary from season to season. Uh, having said that, uh, most growers that I'm aware of, if they're seeing 10, Female scale on a fruit that's excessive. That's that's a, a trigger threshold to, to get out there and start controlling. Um, others, if you're a Valencia grower, that would be more. If you're a lemon grower, that would be less. But uh, as far as an a, a economic threshold, the best answer is it will depend, and you'll just need to get with your pest control advisor and, and discuss that. Okay. All right, I've got another one for you. Um, what is the role of ants in protecting the scale and spreading the pests? And what role does a flowering cover crop play in enhancing biocontrol? I guess it's two questions. <laughs> Those are great questions. Oh, this, that's, that's, uh, I appreciate that because uh, ants and California red scale, red scale offers nothing to, to the uh, foraging ants. Uh, they don't emit honeydew. They don't provide any food source. So the ants tend to... If, if an ant encounters an aphidus uh, being active in red scale, it may attack, but the 
ants are really more interested in the citricola scale and the brown soft scale because those produce things that the ants can use for, for food, uh, the honeydew. And so ants will um, effectively pr protect the scale from, the, from parasites. Uh, again, that's a soft scale issue, not so much a hard scale or, or red scale um, effect. Cover crops. Cover crops are fantastic for providing a, a resource for beneficial insects. Uh, I know for a fact that David Haviland is a very big proponent of six-spotted thrips as a predator of, of spider mites, right? Uh, so a, a cover crop will provide areas for, for naturally occurring beneficials to harbor and to breed and to reproduce. Uh, my only concern is that uh, flower thrips are a pest of citrus. Uh, there, there could be some issues about getting machinery, getting equipment in and out of an orchard. So all of those things have to be weighed against each other. But uh, there, there, is, there are quite a few growers who like the flowering cover crop. One of the last implications, of course, has to do with bees. And there are times in a citrus growing season, flowering, bloom, that uh, the citrus growers do not want the bees out there because they, uh, a citrus fruit that is pollinated will produce seed. So all these dynamics come into play, but uh, cover crops are certainly a great refuge for beneficial insects. Okay, good, thanks. Uh, Mondo, we'll go back over to you. Um, is there an optimal size uh, of treated areas in the orchard? What are the limit limits of, or is there the limit? Yeah, there isn't an optimal size for the treated areas for checkmate. You can go as low as one acre and treat that with our dispenser. Uh, so that you know, anything uh, less than one acre, uh, I don't, I don't think it's recommended, but one acre and above, go ahead and use our checkmate okay. zero dispenser. Okay, and another listener wants to know how long does one application last? That'd probably be for you um, too, Mondo. What, what do they mean one application? Does it mean like the the They must mean uh, one one yeah, one hanging of <laughs> I'm not sure if you call that an application, but installation yeah. maybe. <laughs> okay, so the once you put a put out our CRS dispenser, it's season long. Uh, so in the previous slides, um, you know, we have tested this on a wide range of climatic conditions, and its its exact duration of the product depends on the weather condition that it undergoes in the field. So um, it, it's 365 days. And there's been okay, some good. studies that it, it can show longer than 365 days. All right. Okay, good. Um, Greg, we will go back over to you with what are the general costs per acre to place, um, not including the labor. So I guess just for the cost of the, uh, the device. And Well, Zotera sells all of our products through, uh, through uh, distributors, such as uh, Simplot, Nutrien, Wilbur Ellis, and, and many, many, many others. They're going to uh, uh, have their, their price, the, the uh, I don't know that it's appropriate for me to discuss over on the webinar um, the, the cost of the product per acre, but certainly your pest control advisor, your branch managers will be able to fill you in on that information. Okay. All right. Well, good. Then we'll go on to another question for you, Greg, is will, will the sprays affect the effectiveness of pheromone traps? That's a great question because uh, there's a lot of different things get put out into a citrus orchard over the course of a season. So the easy answer is yes. If you're putting out an insecticide, you can expect that the, uh, the male population and the females uh, will be affected. Uh, there is really no, no uh, problem putting an oil spray or an insecticide spray out while the dispensers are out. It uh, does not affect them in the least. Uh, things like fungicides, um, micronutrients, again, uh, no worries applying those right over the top of a, of a pheromone-treated uh, orchard. 
there might be a, a, some minor question about using uh, Kalen or Surround. And uh, that's something that we would like to look into in, in upcoming seasons. But uh, uh, I, I would expect there would be li very little a negative effect on putting a, a kale in uh, application in your citrus. So I, I know it kind of got off topic there. Does it affect the, the pheromone traps? Not so much, except for when you're reducing the population. Otherwise, they should just perform as usual. But make sure that your pheromone traps, the, the sticky cards, are changed out. They don't get dirty. They don't get dusty. They don't get full of leaves and other insects. Um, so keep, keep those uh, maintained on a frequent basis. All right, um, Mondo, we'll go back over to you with one of our listeners uh, would like to know, were there trials with Movento, Centaur, or Seven that did not affect Checkmate? And I hope uh, I'm reading yes, that I question think, correctly. Yeah, I think Greg just touched that, you know, what he is, you know, we were saying that, uh, you know, any insecticide spray uh, does not impact the performance of our Checkmate CRS. Uh, they typically outperform each other on their own, and there is no studies that show that any of the insecticide sprays are impacting uh, the dispersal of the pheromone. Okay. All right. Um, boy, the questions are coming in quickly. Let's see. Here's one um, for Greg. Uh, do you have any trapping guidelines for use when monitoring in a disrupted orchard? Absolutely, I do, and I would say your trapping guidelines would would not change from if you're using the mating disruption or not. Keep the traps in the, the orchard; they will catch far less, uh, but they will still catch some. Uh, the, the The traps are a very local effect, somewhere between 20 and 50 feet from the, the actual lure, as opposed to the mating disruption, which can throw much farther. Having said that, uh, no, you really need to have the, the traps and lures. It's not a something where, I, oh, I put the mating disruption out and I can forget about red scale forever. We do not want you to do that. Uh, so um, maintain the same uh, trap placement as you would in a conventional orchard. Just expect to have uh, one-tenth or even fewer of the, the red scale that you would expect to catch to be actually on the cards in that situation. Okay, good. And also for you, Greg, um, someone writes in and says, I may have missed it, but please describe the proper placement of the dispenser. I've never heard of that again. Absolutely right. That's okay, because this is important. Uh, we do not want them low on the tree. We want them – it's actually most important to get the dispenser into the canopy. Do not hang them out in the sunlight. Uh, that's not going to help anything. It will actually degrade the pheromone more quickly if they're – out in the bright sun, it's 105. The correct placement for the, the dispenser is arm's length inside the canopy on a nice, healthy branch that's uh, what, uh, a half inch, three quarters of an inch in diameter. Uh, the, the clip is designed to fit over that size of a branch and not be removed. So arm's length inside the canopy, Four feet to six feet above the soil surface is appropriate. We do not need to get them all the way to the top of the tree, and but we really don't want to see them down in the skirts either. The last thing I want to mention about placement of these is either do your pruning before you apply your dispensers or get those dispensers into the tree canopy so deep that they won't be pruned out if you do have a field operation later on in the season because the, the last thing you want is all that good red scale pheromone laying on the ground to, to be shredded up. That's, <laughs> that's not uh, helping anybody. Yeah, and what, okay, I, what well, I want to touch on... Oh, go ahead. And what, and what I want to touch on that, um, on the tree and height requirements, um, it's also on our product label, uh, the directions for use, and I'll explain to you how to uh, apply the dispensers, and I'll, I'll mention that mid-height and in, in a part. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'm just going to ask this just in case um, this applies to something that maybe you didn't cover. Um, one person wrote, is the Checkmate CRS pheromone heavier than air? Wouldn't you want to hang the dispensers higher in the tree canopy to avoid non-disrupted areas? 
high in the canopy where spray coverage may be less than optimal. So you, you may have covered that, but it was so specific I wanted to make sure I covered it. No, that's, a, that's actually a great question because it's a common misperception that these pheromone molecules, they're big. They're big, they're carbon, they're, they're heavy. They're not rocks. They're not BBs. They're not going to fall out of the tree and, and roll around on the ground. The, the insects themselves use these things, and they do lift and they do move with air currents. And a citrus canopy is very well suited to have this uh, pheromone, you know, think of it as roiling and boiling inside of the canopy and moving around with the air currents. Citrus, uh, the, the soil underneath a citrus tree uh, tends to be warm because there's a lot of decay, there's a lot of organic matter down there. That warmth rises and it carries the pheromone up and around and through and out. So the, these things aren't, aren't rocks, you're not gonna fall to the ground. They will move through the air. And uh, uh, it, yes, it is true that the tops of citrus trees, especially the big ones, are very difficult to get good spray coverage in. But I would expect even at a six foot height, you'll get pheromone all the way through uh, the, the, the canopy of the tree. That should not be a problem. Okay, good. All right, Mondo, um, here's a question for you. Um, are endophytes like Bovaria bassiana used with Cetera pheromones, and do they have any impact? And Mondo, if you don't want to jump in with that, if Greg doesn't, we can take that offline as well. So <laughs> That's okay. Uh, um, Bovaria bassiana is a microbial. It's used for... for um, I believe it's for Lepidoptera as for some other insects, but uh, uh, there is no impact. There are two different issues. Uh, Bovaria, well, oh, Bo Bovaria, yes, it's, it's for um, uh, Coleoptera. Anyway, no, there's no impact on using Bovaria and the pheromone. Uh, they, they do not interact with each other at all. All right, and here's one. Um, if I have red scales in my backyard lemon tree, can I use the pheromone dispensers at home too? That would be tempting, but is that allowed? <laughs> I'll take that one. And that could be um, for either of you. I, yeah. yeah, I can just say that, um, yeah. So everything that we presented here was focused on commercial agriculture commodities. So for backyard trees, I would say that you can contact your local UC Master Gardener program uh, to get an answer for that. Okay, all right, good. Uh, let's see, all right, we still have a few more questions here. Um, here's one, if, if endangered animals are in the area, such as lizards, um, will the traps kill such animals? No, uh, although I've seen many things in pheromone traps, uh, um, the California red scale trap hangs vertically in the tree, and it's highly unlikely that uh, anything other than an insect, uh, and I have seen gnats, and I've seen moths, and I've seen thrips, mites will get into the red scale traps, but never some, anything as large as a lizard. Uh, I have seen such in uh, wing traps or, or delta traps for other crops, other commodities, but uh, the pheromone Nothing can detect that pheromone other than a male California red scale. So there's nothing attractive to the to the card other than that pheromone. I know that there are some yellow sticky cards out there. They're used for uh, Asian citrus psyllid, and they also attract other insects. Although I have been, in my experience, in my 30 years, I have not seen a something as large as a, as a lizard stuck in one of those traps <laughs> either. So. Uh, I have to say the answer would be no. It, it would have uh, negligible of any attraction to any other organism except for the insects. Okay, good. And we're getting close to the end, but we've got a couple more questions here. Um, one, and I guess this will be for you, Greg. Is there a pheromone available for ACP? Oh, there's a touchy question because the, the short answer is yes, kind of. Uh, there is a attractant for Asian citrus psyllid. It was trialed by University of California at Davis Entomologist, and it works uh, sometimes. I think that's the best uh, uh, um, 
uh, news that I can give. That's what that's what I have heard from people who are actually running those trap lines. Is that uh, uh, the addition of the lure to the uh, citrus psyllid trap um, may or may not enhance its catch. I don't I don't think it's uh, um, really been statistically proven one way or the other. But there but a lure does exist. Okay. Oh, well, that's a good answer. <laughs> Okay, um, let's see, Mondo, I think, and this will probably be our last question here, which is, um, do you have, uh, wait, do you have the only white sticky card for CRS? Uh, yes, we only have the white sticky cards. Uh, we have not done any studies using a different color for a sticky card, so, um, or for monitoring, so. If you're talking about color, if there's a difference, uh, white cards um, have been the standard for uh, most press trap monitoring. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I want to thank our audience for joining us today. I think we are out of time. But um, I, ho I hope you gained a lot of good information from the webinar. And if there are any questions that are not answered, we will uh, follow up with you after the webinar. We have your email and the question you asked. I also want to tell you you can access the webinar online at growingproduce.com forward slash webinars, or you can just uh, in a couple of hours use the link that you used today, and you can go back and watch parts of it or all of it again. As far as the credit, uh, this webinar has been approved by CCA for a half credit. You don't have to do anything for that. We'll send in your names to CCA uh, along with your CCA numbers. For CDPR credit, um, they have been delayed because of the mail, so we don't have final approval on the credit yet, but we're going to operate as if we have. So if you would like that credit, please take the quiz at the end of the webinar. It will pop up as soon as you sign off. If you pass it with 70%, send me um, your certificate at the email address there, and then I will take care of sending your uh, credit into CDPR when uh, we actually receive approval from them. So I'm sorry we don't have the final approval now, but the, the mail is moving slowly, and that's how we have to submit things. So um, again, thank you again for the webinar, or, or for coming to the webinar, um, and we appreciate your time today. Have a great day.